Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Blister Podcast on the Blister Podcast Network. I'm Jonathan Ellsworth, and you can check out everything we're doing and reviewing over at blisterreview.com. Okay, so last Friday, we published a Gear 30 conversation with McKenna Peterson to talk about some of her personal ski gear preferences. And today, we are pushing the gear conversation aside, and instead, we are diving into McKenna's past and present to talk about her segment in the new MSP film, to discuss some of the formative events of her life, and to learn more about what makes this professional skier and professional commercial fishing captain tick. Okay, two things before we get going here. Our new Winter Buyer's Guide drops this week. So if you'd like to be the first to receive a downloadable copy of the biggest and best Winter Buyer's Guide in the world, then become a Blister member, because as a way to say thank you to our Blister members, you will be seeing the guide first. The print edition of the guide will then be shipping out and showing up a bit later. So become a Blister member to get the new guide first and to also receive a bunch of exclusive deals on gear and to get access to all of our flash reviews and deep dive reviews and to get our personalized gear recommendations. You just send us an email and we then figure out with you the gear that we believe will work best for you and where and how you ski or bike. Okay, one more thing. If you aren't already subscribed to our Bikes and Big Ideas podcast, you really need to rectify that ASAP because last Thursday we published a conversation with the new World Cup downhill overall champion, Valley Hole, and we had Matt Manzer of Gear 30 fame, co-host that conversation with me. That was a really fun episode, and Valley is terrific, so check that one out. And then this week on Bikes and Big Ideas, we've got the GOAT, Greg Minar. So subscribe to Bikes and Big Ideas to check out those and a bunch of other really good conversations, if I do say so myself. And speaking of cool and accomplished people, it's time now to talk to another one, pro skier McKenna Peterson. So here we go. Well, McKenna, welcome to Blister Headquarters. Thank you. Happy to be here. I'm in a room with about 200 pairs of skis, so I couldn't be more comfortable. That's right. (laughs) And we just had some good food in town good conversation in town. And then, you know, we came up here like we like to do to, you know, record a proper conversation surrounded by a lot of skis. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Well, so you are out here with some of the squad from MSP's newest film. We just had the sort of global premiere. Was this two nights ago now? Yep. Two nights ago, we premiered MSP's The Stomping Grounds, their newest flick, and it's really good. It's really good. That was my first time seeing it, Huh? and I got sucked in like I was sitting in the audience watching my first ski movie of the year. It was, got me fired up to ski. A hundred percent. And like, we're kind of in this space where we're just like gunning to finish up this buyer's guide. And, you know, I mean, there's no snow on the ground right now. It's just beautiful like fall and you're kind of like okay we still got some time to ride bikes and stuff and so i'm kind of rushing over to this movie premiere definitely not in the mindset of like i'm so excited to ski and then the movie started and then everything changed yep same yeah same i honestly haven't thought about skiing in the past couple months i've been so preoccupied but that movie was like okay it's time let's go It was really interesting, too. I mean, it's just that there's been so many kind of iconic MSP films at this point. I think I just wasn't prepared to be like, wait, this actually might be among my favorite MSP films. I was not expecting that either. And yet, and I heard a number of people you know, at the crowd talking to folks after and they were like, no, that's definitely one of my favorite MSP films. So 
couple of surprises, I think, coming away. So good yeah. job. Good job, I guess, McKenna. Thank you. It was, there were a lot of us involved, but everybody did a great job, especially the editors and the filmers. That was a great performance. I'm so psyched on that film and honored to be a part of it. But before we say anything more about that film, I thought it would be appropriate to ask you, in your opinion, what would you call the greatest ski film of all time? That is a big question. The greatest ski film of all time. I feel like that's one of those things where I need to sit down, I need to rewatch, and I yeah. need to analyze, and I need to go deep. But first thing that came to my mind when you asked me, I just have to go with the classic like Blizzard of Oz. I mean, I've seen it so many times, and it's entertaining every time. Related question. I don't know if it's the same answer. If it's not the same answer, what ski film would you say was personally like the most influential ski film for you? That one's easier. TGR's Tangerine Dream and Anomaly. Victoria Jelous, I think is how you pronounce her name. Snowboarder. I've been on a snowboard maybe three times in my life. But watching her ride in Alaska is what gave me the idea that I wanted to do that one day. She's phenomenal. I rewatched her segments over and over and over again. And still, I try and ride like she did. That's amazing. I yeah. love that. I love that. So talk a little bit about this new little road trip that you're on. Like, let's, let's set the table for people. Who are you out here with? You, you all kind of came in to Crested Butte, and then I believe your next stop is Denver? Yep, our next stop is Denver. Then we will all go to Seattle. After Seattle, we all split up for a little bit. I'm not sure when we'll come back together, but now that we're able to cross the border to Canada, hopefully we will all be skiing together this winter. So I'm here with... Logan Peota, Sam Cooch, The Blondes, who I love spending time with, Emily Childs, Tanya Kivik, and Janelle Yip. And they're incredible. Um, Sam Cohen is also out here, Wing Ty Barrymore. We have a great crew going. And Scott Gaffney. And of we course, Scott Gaffney. Scott. We shouldn't leave Do Scott. Do not leave Scott out. So yeah, we're lucky to be able to spend time with him. So how are group dynamics so far with, with the squad? <laughs> is anybody on your nerves yet? Is there a lot of infighting? H how are things going? Everybody's having a blast. We're all here to have fun. Everybody's getting along. Everyone's supportive. We're having so much fun. Today we went on a big mountain bike ride. I haven't been on a bike in about a year. I'm fresh off of sea level. I got my butt kicked today. They were waiting for me all day and were supportive and clapping and giving me high fives and just supportive, awesome, fun group dynamics. Well, and in, in fairness to you, yeah, you have been hanging out at sea level, right, for months. And you had to ride Doctors Park today. And so I think that's okay. I think that makes <laughs> perfect sense that you're like, I'm not quite, you know, where I might want to be. And this was your first bike ride in a year? Mm -hmm. yeah. No, well, not technically my first. We rode a couple days ago on Crested Butte Resort. Okay, and not chairlifts though. So no, you not chairlifts. You weren't getting off the hook that easy. Uh -uh. But okay, all right. So yeah. you're, you're getting around a good bit. I told them all I'd kick their ass in a month, so just you know, wait for it. They were like, she, "She's probably that's probably true." <laughs> so they were just real. They were just real nice today. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the film and specifically your portions of the film. Talk a bit about that. Did the actual filming for this all take place this past year? I mean, I feel like we were in such a weird spot with just COVID disruptions and stuff. So I guess I wasn't quite sure if some of this had actually started two seasons ago and, you know, what have you. So straighten us out here. So this was all filmed last year. And that's the theme of the movie. That's why it's called The Stomping Grounds. We all filmed at home. So everybody filmed in their home resort, um, with the exception of the Alaska trip that we did. 
where we flew up to Alaska and we set up camp and created our own home and then skied out of our back door. So that is the theme of the movie. And it worked out, obviously, it worked out very well. You can tell when you pay attention to the film that skiing was quite a bit better in Canada last year than it was in the States. But everything turned out well. There are some great stories and some amazing characters. The characters in the film are incredible and captivating. And you're one of them, actually, McKenna, in case you, in case you <laughs> forgot. But I have to say, another of the characters is your mom. <laughs> and I think she stole some hearts. I think she stole some hearts. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, it, I don't think that's a part of your story that I, that I knew actually that much about. So can you tell us a little, I don't feel, that's not, that's not stealing too much thunder. I don't think. No, no. <laughs> yep. My mother is in the newest MSP movie. Um, which the funny thing about that is Scott was in town filming us for the segment and he asked to come over and film an inter interview with my mom my mom hates being interviewed she hates speaking she hates being on the camera she hates pressure so i just didn't tell her <laughs> and invited scott over to her house and as he was pulling in i said hey mom scott gaffney's here he's gonna ask you a few questions for the movie and she flipped <laughs> she was so mad at me but she did it and huh. she did a great job she did she so did. she called me maybe four times the other night when the movie was being premiered to ask me how she looked and how she did and how she spoke. <laughs> mom, it's fine. You did great. She did great. She truly um, did. Mm -hmm. So my mom was a ski bum in Sun Valley. Um, she met Dick Barrymore, who was making ski films back in the 80s. Well, longer before that, but this is when she was involved was in the 80s. And she filmed in two of his ski movies. And um, the Sun Valley segment in this newest, newest MSP flick talks about Dick Barrymore and the history of Sun Valley and the history of filmmaking in Sun Valley. And they show some of my mom's old footage, which is pretty exciting. She's ripping pow in a yes. one piece with her blonde hair flowing, no hat, no sunglasses, no goggles, just <laughs> all graceful and beautiful. Yes. And so to, to sort of carry the torch as you are doing i mean it if this was a if this was like a movie you'd be like that's okay that's too hard to believe or something stranger than fiction better than fiction i think so let's talk about this a bit sun valley ketchum haley this is your stop i i feel like i'm becoming slowly becoming like a little bit of an expert you know in this area i, I was out there a few months ago i seem to be meeting more and more people from that you know, corner of the world. It's been really cool learning more about that community. And so talk a little bit about your own experience kind of coming up. Very fortunate to have grown up in Ketchum, Idaho. Both my parents ended up there because they wanted to ski. That's why they were there. And then they figured out the rest later. You know, we grew up with my Brother, sister, and I grew up with a very outdoor lifestyle. We skied every day. We didn't know that was not normal until we got older and left home. You know, the ski resort is five minutes from town. Fairly convenient. I mean, I'm pretty sure I skied over 100 days a year from the age of 10. It's just... A dream situation that I didn't create. I'm so grateful my parents created that for us. Um, I left when I was 18. Um, I lived in Salt Lake City for 12 years and I have moved back home. I'm now living in Haley, which is 12 miles south of Ketchum, same valley. So now I am 15 minutes from the ski resort, which, you know, sometimes is an issue, <laughs> but it's just a beautiful place. You know, incredible people, magical scenery beautiful mountains, big mountains, all of the activities. And was skiing for you initially like truly ski racing or was it always a bit broader than that from the jump? It was always broader than ski racing. I got very into racing. I raced until I was 19 years old. I was pretty serious. I wasn't that good 
I was decent, but I wasn't going to make the U.S. ski team. I wasn't going to go anywhere with it. I did love it. But all the trips I would do for ski races in high school, if it snowed, I would be bailing on my side slipping duties and out in a back bowl somewhere. So it was always mostly about skiing and ski racing was just an avenue to keep skiing as much as possible. What were your favorite disciplines in racing or I mean, did you like them all equally or what were, and and maybe that's a different question from like, what did you happen to be the best at, but what did you like the most? I liked racing downhill the most. I was not the best at it. I weighed a hundred pounds. I was, did not ride a flat ski very well, but I loved racing downhill. I loved going fast and I loved hitting the jumps. I was the best at GS and super G. So those are my disciplines. Okay. So you said you were pretty heavy in the race thing until 19 and talk a little bit about what was going through your head at that time or how did things transition a bit for you at that point? This is fitting since we're in Crested Butte. Uh Uh-huh. So I know you got a big (laughs) smile on your face. (laughs) I went to school at University of Colorado in Boulder. I was not good enough to race on their NCAA team. So I was racing on their USCSA team, which was super fun. I loved it. I raced with them all winter. I traveled around, had a blast, great people, continued to train, still thought maybe I could get on the NCAA team. Wasn't going to happen. I heard about the Crested Butte Extremes. So a ski race friend and I, my friend Allie Rude, got in the car and drove over to Crested Butte and signed up for the Extremes. And that was my first big mountain competition. And I fell in love. It's like, this is what's happening. This is way better than ski racing. Everybody's friendly. We're having fun. We're taking shots at the bottom of the course. This is the type of skiing I like to do. Hell yeah. I'm going to keep going. So after that season at CU, I transferred to University of Utah to be at Snowbird and Alta. Quit ski racing altogether and joined the Big Mountain Tour. We just had dinner for like two hours and this part did not come up. (laughs) Uh I didn't know that you went to CU Boulder to start. One year. Okay. Well, that still counts. It was a little too far away from the mountains for me. Yeah. But it did introduce me to Crested Butte. And that first competition I did here was a major life-changing experience for me. I was so nervous I threw up in the starting gate. But I skied well. I did well. I watched Laura Ogden ski. I believe she won that competition and my jaw dropped. It's like, okay, how do I do that? It was incredible. What's funny about your story, which I didn't know about that CB was your first comp, Chris Davenport was sitting on that couch like not many weeks ago, sort of telling a very similar story. So it's uh, it's funny to kind of get the, hear the, some of the similarities and these origin stories from some of you folks. So pretty good company. Yeah. You're pretty good company. Okay. So you, you run the CB comp and you're like, I like this world. I like this community. And then how do you start making a way your way through this world? I just wanted to ski. So I was going to school at the time I was commercial fishing in the summer. So all of my income came from my summer job. I ended up working out my school schedule so that I only took classes in the fall and then did online classes in the spring. So I had the winter off and I pretty much have been on that. <laughs> program. I've been on that program since, yeah. except for now winter's turned into more of a job. But at that time I was just loading up in a van with all my buddies and driving around to the big mountain comps. We went to every single stop on the tour, drove around between the U S and Canada competed, skied pow along the way, did hut trips along the way, did whatever we could afford, fully ski bumming it. Slept in parking lots, ate out of gas stations. I think those were the best years of my life. Yeah, there were no obligations. We were just skiing every day, having fun. We just, we loved to ski. I got to back you up, even though that was wonderful and lovely. What were you studying in school? I have a degree in human physiology and nutrition. 
Okay, well, that's surprising because that somehow didn't come up at dinner either. But so please go ahead. It did take me eight years to mm. get my bachelor's degree. Eight years. Okay. Eight years. Okay. And I skied every winter. And I hope that this does not come across as bragging or conceited. I hope it does. But I did pay for my college 100% from money that I earned commercial fishing, which is something I'm very proud of. That is not bragging. That's to quote Drake. I don't talk shit. I state facts. <laughs> yeah. I think you're just stating facts. No, that's badass. You paid your way through college commercial fishing. Correct. And skied every winter. And skied every winter. And did a degree in physiology? Physiology. Mm -hmm. I was originally on the pre-med track. Decided that wasn't for me. And then I started doing the nutrition, athletic training side. That also wasn't for me. But I did end up getting a degree in it. And I... At the end, I ended up being more interested in the nutrition than the physiology and the medical stuff. So I think if I were to ever go back to school or have a big change of direction in my life, I could see myself going back to school for some sort of nutrition. So are you mad at me that I made you eat animal fries tonight? No, not okay. at all. That doesn't okay. mean that I don't eat. I eat, I, like I said earlier, I eat everything. Yeah. So no, the funny part of that is because we were talking a lot about writing and reading and I talked a little bit about my background and we're sort of covering some of the same territory, just not quite in exactly the same order of things maybe. Okay. I'm learning a lot here. This is good. Okay. So the, the nutrition stuff that is still of interest today. Yes, it is. It's, it is interesting. It it's, is inherently. Yes, it's inherently interesting what we put in our body and how it affects us and the differences between different types of foods and vitamins and minerals and how they affect different people individually and how we live our lives and what we do and the choices we make and then the inundation of processed foods into our diets and how huge of an effect that's having on our society. And it's, inter it's an interesting topic. It's always changing and fluctuating, and I find it fascinating. So you say today that you eat everything. So have you done much in terms of experimentation with like, oh, yeah, she's nodding vigorously. Okay, so y you would currently describe yourself as an omnivore? I'm actually like a big advocate of like experimenting with the diet stuff. I just think there are probably certain ways that each of us might individually eat where we do just tend to feel really good. And so I, I like that kind of experimentation with different stuff. So like, are you currently in a experimenting phase? Or are you kind of in a like, man, I'm on the road and like, you know what I mean? Like we have some times where we get really focused on this and other times where we're like, I'm not going to worry about that too much right now. Where are you currently at? Right now I am not experimenting and I haven't for a while. I have been an omnivore and in kind of easy going. I know how to eat healthy. I know what my body needs. I'm going to do that. I love French fries. I will eat French fries whenever they're there type of situation. I drink alcohol, um, but I have experimented in the past. And my overall feeling on dieting is if you're going to diet, like it's okay to experiment but you need to have a mindset where you don't get upset with yourself if you go off of it. So experiment with something if you feel great. And if you truly feel great, you will keep doing that because you feel so good. But if you don't feel great and then you break that diet and then you beat yourself up because of it, it wasn't worth doing it in the first place. So we're all different. We're all individual. Different things work for each of us. The best way to go about it is just to do what feels good for you. No matter what goals you're trying to reach, do what makes you feel the best. And it's not going to be what makes the guy next to you feel the best. You've talked a bit about the commercial fishing stuff. And one of the things that I think is particularly interesting about your story is that, I mean, all of us, are influenced 
by our parents to some degree. You literally just had a movie come out where there's a segment dedicated to like you and your mom and your mom being this Sun Valley skier and you are kind of following suit. And it's pretty profound to me on the commercial fishing side of things. One, learning just exactly how much of a family affair that has been. I mean, in sort of the most significant way, right? I mean, this is unique, I think. And we were talking a bit about this at dinner, but I'd love to hear you just say a bit more about this. I I imagine some people are familiar with this part of your story, but how it is that you are a professional skier who is also running a commercial fishing operation simultaneously. My family is very close, and we always have been. We're lucky to have that. Both of my parents were ski bums when they met. Skiing was their biggest passion. That's why they were in Sun Valley. So they raised us to be skiers. We were brought up with skiing being a top priority of life. We do things in order to ski. Skiing is what happens. And my siblings and I all loved it. You know, that doesn't always happen. That doesn't always work. But somehow my parents ended up with three kids that loved to ski. So that's what our lives revolved around. And then even as we got older and left home, all three of our lives continued to revolve around skiing. So the reason my dad became a commercial fisherman was because he wanted to leave Seattle where he grew up move to the mountains and find a job where he could only work in the summer and screw off (laughs) and (laughs) ski all winter. So he went commercial fishing when he was 18 years old, decided that was the life for him and, you know, worked his way up to buying his own boat and then buying a bigger boat and having a very successful business operation in the fishing industry. And throughout my entire life, That's what my dad did. He worked very hard in the summer and he skied every single day of the winter. And then he would joke that he had three kids in order to have a crew. Quote unquote joke. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure what's happening there, but (laughs) he did convince all three of us to go fishing with him when we were teenagers and um, we pretty much stuck with it. Um, Those pivotal years where... My brother was 18, 19, 20. I was, you know, 20, 21, 22. Happened to be very big fishing seasons. So we made a lot of money. And my sister was still in high school at the time. So she was only coming up for short stints and wasn't getting paid a full crew share. But those years were kind of like light bulb. Oh, well, we could just go work for three months and then we don't have to do anything else but ski. Why wouldn't you do this with your life? So my brother and I got roped in that way. My sister eventually got roped in the same way. And all three of us and Dylan Crossman, who we were just speaking of, Dylan Crossman did seven years on the boat. So we were the crew. That's amazing. So I'm trying to think calendar-wise because... Most schools would start before you were off the boat, right? Was this an issue? This was an issue. Okay. So when I was going to school, I would leave the boat early. Okay. To go back to school and someone would come up and take my spot. That was an issue because usually the heat of fishing is August, September. And I would maybe get three weeks of it and then I would bail and someone else would come in and only work for three weeks and just make bank. So that was hard. But You're sitting there in class mad. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's how that But I was committed to going to school. I was committed to finishing and getting my degree. Even though it took eight years. I did eight years straight and I did make it happen. This is the part that I was surprised to hear from you that, well, I mean, we're kind of talking about high school versus college, I guess. We were talking a bit about writing, reading and writing. And did the interest in writing 
you know, that's not what you went off to school to study, as you told us. Did the interest in reading and writing, did that happen earlier or did that sort of happen post college years? The interest in reading and writing happened in high school. I went to a phenomenal high school in Sun Valley, the Sun Valley Community School. Both of my English professors are amazing people that I still talk to and communicate with. Um, Ryan Waterfield is the editor of Big Life Magazine. Yeah. Um, She pushed me to be a writer. She pushed me when I was in high school. When I went to college, I wanted to study something different. Even some of my college professors would write on things that I had turned in. What are you thinking about doing? You should think about writing. Forgive me for this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. And you and I have not talked about this yet. A a wild thing for me when I was in Ketchum not too long ago, I mean, it is a Hemingway town. His imprint is kind of everywhere. And Old Man in the Sea is the first book I loved. And I didn't, I just thought of that right now, even though we've been talking about this whole fishing background and present of yours. Is that cliche? Is there, are you like, oh my God, rolling your eyes, like yet another one type of thing? Be honest. You can be honest. It's not cliche because it's valid. Oh, that's very that's sweet. Valid. Of you. That means it is cliche. She just happens to be nice. <laughs> we were forced to read a lot of Hemingway in high school. Not your cup of tea. I should revisit it now. I loved The Sun Also Rises. Mm-hmm. But that was it. <laughs> okay. And I think maybe part of that was me being a little bit of a rebel. Uh huh. And everybody's being so into Hemingway that I had to find reasons why it wasn't as great as everyone thought it was. I mean, it, it is great. Obviously, Hemingway is, it's, it's beautiful literature. But it is something that I have not revisited, and it's all around me. I actually have one of Ernest Hemingway's typewriters in my family. What? It's on display at the community library in Ketchum. Which I totally hung out at multiple days. Okay, I probably sat like right next to it, actually. How did you get a hold of a Hemingway typewriter? You stole that. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Yeah, my you stole grandfather, that. my mom's father, also grew up in Ketchum. My mom was raised in Ketchum in the summers. Her parents were split, but she'd spend the summers in Ketchum with her dad. He was a writer and had some connection with that group of people around Hemingway after he had passed. And somehow through his writing, he ended up with one of his typewriters. When he passed away, my mom and her siblings gave it to the library and it's on display at the library. But maybe if I got a hold of that typewriter. I didn't want to say it, but that's what I was thinking. I've thought about it. I've asked, but I don't want to take that away from the community. (sighs) But it's, it's it's crossed my mind. I think it should cross your mind. And I think Hemingway would be stoked on that because I (laughs) frankly think, sorry, community library, you're amazing. Truly amazing. I think Hemingway would like the idea that his typewriter was producing literature as opposed to being on display. Also, could you imagine writing on a typewriter right now? That's pretty intimidating. It's true. It's true. I mean, can you even buy bottles of whiteout? I don't know. But (laughs) you and I have been talking about some of the Either we're just lazy, which is, you know, we'll accept responsibility where we need to accept responsibility. But sometimes like in our modern world, you know, whether it's the easy presence of social media or just throwing a podcast on rather than sitting or sitting down to do the work of like concentrated reading or writing, I bet having a device like that might actually break us out of the routine enough that it would, I don't know. I think you should try this, even though, again, apologies to the community library. (laughs) I don't know. Yeah. I think I will. I did inquire about it recently. Okay. So it could happen. So to stay with this thread of 
the influence of parents, I think it's really cool. On the one hand, it's very, very clear that your folks very much sort of gave you the gift of introducing you to a love of the mountains and snow and building a life where you can prioritize those things. But to then literally be carrying on your dad's business, you know? I mean, I guess some people inherit their dad's car dealership or something, but this just feels very different than I think many of the ways where if something like that does happen, I don't know. Does it feel that way to you or does it feel more like, well, I don't know. This is just what I've known for a really long time. A little bit of both in the sense of, um, so my dad passed away in the end of 2016. He died in an avalanche. It was sudden and unexpected. Previous to that, I had no desire to run the fishing boat. I was making good money working for him. I loved working for my dad. I loved the boat. I loved my summers. That was my program. When we were trying to figure out what we were going to do with the boat and the fishing business, I had the thought of, well, I'll just run it. I love being on the boat. I don't want to not go fishing. So how do we do this? Um, that first year, we hired a good friend of our family's, a guy, Bob Ayers, good friend of my dad's. He had run the Atlantis. The Atlantis is the name of my boat. He had run the Atlantis in past years. He had a lot of experience. He was retired from seining, the type of fishing we do at the time. But he came back and he ran the boat the first half of that first season without my dad and just trained me, taught me a lot. There were so many aspects of fishing that I hadn't paid attention to. Or I should say I hadn't thought I paid attention to. Because when I actually did take over when Bob left and I actually was responsible and was riding the boat, I surprised myself with what I knew and didn't know that I knew. Just from so many years of being there and absorbing information that I didn't think twice about. So it was a little bit of not premeditated. I did not think that I was going to be a commercial fishing captain. But when the, when everything happened, it seemed like the easiest, best, of course, that's what I'm going to do. Why would I do anything else? It was natural. Do you have this conversation with your mom? Like, <laughs> are you guys like, is she ever like, what are you doing? <laughs> Uh, or is she like, absolutely, I love this, keep going forth? How, how did those conversations go? Those were interesting. Those, those conversations with my mom and my siblings boiled down to don't feel like you have to do this for your dad. You need to do what's best for you. If this is what you want, we are 100% behind you. But we want to make sure that this is going to make you happy. And it does. And you believe that you have their support if and when should you decide I'm ready to go a different path. Correct. I have their support 100% no matter what. No matter what I decide to do. No matter what I'm doing. That's pretty good spot to be in, it sounds like. And you said, I, I had asked you, you know, is this the kind of thing where, you know, you get to like not think about the fishing business once you get off the boat. You know, what did you say things? The season usually wraps up end of September. Correct, end of September. But you set me straight on that. You don't get to just like forget about the boat and the fish. Talk a little bit about what that looks like for you because you are skiing a lot and filming and the like during your winter. So, what does the boat require of you when? you aren't actually actively commercial fishing. The boat always requires a lot of work. <laughs> She's needy. <laughs> um, luckily, when I inherited the boat, she was in great shape. Like beautiful, well-maintained, well-taken care of, great shape. And I'm trying to keep her up to par. 
trying my hardest. And I feel like I've been doing a good job of that, but it does require a lot of time and a lot of effort and money. Um, So throughout the winter, I go to Seattle every six to eight weeks-ish, sometimes more, sometimes a little more time off, um, just to, well, first check on the boat. Um, She's parked in Fisherman's Terminal in Seattle in the water. So she's just tied up. You gotta go check on her and make sure she's okay and work on projects. So right now I'm in the process of planning my winter with boat projects, kind of as ski things start to line up and I can work all of that together. Um, Thankfully, K2 is based in Seattle and I go to Seattle a lot for K2 things and can tie in boat stuff at the same time. Last year when I was on the trip for the MSP segment in the Tordrillos in Alaska, that trip ended up going two weeks over what it was supposed to go because we got weathered out in the beginning and we ended up spending 12 days sitting in Anchorage waiting to go into the mountains. And when I was sitting in Anchorage, I was like, I am a three-hour flight from my fishing boat. I have all these projects I need to do. I should just go down there and then they call me when the weather gets better. I didn't end up doing that, but I did end up coming off the glacier, getting on an airplane and flying straight to the boat. I didn't even go home. I just threw all my ski stuff in my big fishing locker and went to work. Give us some examples of what you were working on after filming a ski segment for MSP. Oh, last spring I was replumbing my refrigeration system, um, what we use to keep our fish cold when we're holding them for the day. It's had some issues for the past few years. It's kind of been my nemesis. And we had torn a lot of it apart and we're rebuilding it. So since you didn't leave to go do boat projects, how were you spending your downtime? Oh, she got a very (laughs) concerned look on her face, ladies and gentlemen. That was rough. That was hard on all of us. You know, we were all there, ready to go into the towards. We were ready to ski. Conditions were good when we arrived. But then the weather picked up, and we did not have a window to get into the mountains. And Anchorage is not the greatest place to hang out in the winter. So we sat in our hotel. We watched a lot of movies. We hung out. We played a lot of Settlers of Catan. Um, we couldn't do much because of covid So we were pretty limited, and it was slightly crazy-making. So what I wondered if you were going to say is, I did a lot of reading, (laughs) or I did a lot of, I'm halfway done with the novel. Mm -hmm. I knocked out half the novel I've been thinking about for a while. That's not, that was not quite how it went down. It was more hanging out with the group, but very much in downtime. Very much in downtime. And that's funny, I did read a novel on that trip and I can't remember what it was. And I was doing a little bit of reading in the hotel in Anchorage, but true to what we were saying earlier, once I got into my tent on the glacier, I I mean, I finished the book. In the hotel, I was reading five to 10 pages a night. There was a TV and my cell phone. And a pretty fun group of people. And a fun group of people to hang out with. But you get into your tent and it's like, oh, I'm gonna read 60 pages. We all just this need to, is so funny. We all just need to go live in tents. Yeah. Away from yeah, internet and cell reception. McKenna and I have been talking about like how we just get back to reading more. And yeah, this might be it. Just move to Alaska, live in a tent away from stuff. Try and stay warm. Try to stay warm. <laughs> yeah. This is what we're gonna do now. We're gonna actually break here because we have a whole other thing we have to do tonight. Before we let you go back to the rest of the crew, we are going to now record a Gear 30 conversation. We have been very good. We have not nerded out about Gear at all. And so we're going to save that, I think, for this next conversation. And then we can just all like unapologetically do it. And, you know, we don't have to sort of thread two different needles. This has been really cool having you out here, just getting to connect and learn more about your own story. And then like literally the film itself, you know, that segment is, I I just can't imagine like 
a father son duo or a mother daughter duo or whatever, like not many people ever get to have something like that, you know, on screen. It's really a special thing. And so I, I, I hope you feel really good about it. It was super fun to watch. And, uh, you are uh, putting together quite the story, stitching it together, I would say. Can't wait to see where it all goes from here. Thank you. Thank you for chatting with me. It's been fun. Well, we're going to shift gears. I'll see you in a minute over on uh, Gear 30. See you there. Well, that's it for this edition of the Blister Podcast. And be sure to check out our Gear 30 conversation with McKenna, which is great. And don't forget to subscribe to our Bikes and Big Ideas podcast to catch my conversation with Greg Minar. That'll drop this Thursday. Finally, I want to say thanks to McKenna for the conversation. Thanks to Taylor Ahern for producing this episode. And from all of us here in Gunnison and Crested Butte, Colorado, please take good care of yourself and everybody else. And we will be talking with you again later this week. Bye, everybody.